You're listening to episode 83 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. This week's show is all about the DASH diet. Now, the DASH diet is an acronym for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It's a diet rich in fruits and veggies, dairy and fiber, and it's a diet that's low in sodium and saturated fat. And you know what? It's the kind of diet I love to eat, and it's a healthy way of eating whether you have high blood pressure or not. Now, my guest is Roseanne Rust. She's a dietitian, a friend, and author of The Dash Diet for Two, 125 Heart-Healthy Recipes to Lower Your Blood Pressure Together. I like that. Roseanne is an internationally recognized nutrition expert. She's an author, and she has a passion for facts. In fact, she created her blog, Chew the Facts, to help consumers decipher nutrition fact from myth so they can relax and enjoy eating for better health. I like that philosophy. She's also the author of Dash Diet for Dummies, the Glycemic Index Cookbook for Dummies, and the Calorie Counter Journal for Dummies. On this show, we talk about Roseanne's decision to become a dietitian. I always love to get the backstory. Why preventing and treating high blood pressure through a healthy lifestyle is near and dear to her heart. And you'll get some pretty awesome recipes, including noodles with mushrooms and cabbage, delish, and a recipe for grilled shrimp stuffed poppers, an appetizer that will blow your mind. So good. Okay, what do we have? Just a few friendly reminders. If you love the show, tell a friend about it. Post a review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out the show notes for links to Roseanne, her new cookbook, to recipes, to the recipes we talk about on the show. That URL is lizeshealthytable.com slash podcast. And you can just check out the show notes from episode 83. So before we dig into the show, I want to tell you what I did this weekend, because it was so cool, and it's something that's been on my bucket list for many, many years. We went scalloping. So I live out here in Nantucket. It's an island off the coast of Massachusetts, and every October is scallop season. So you see these people out in the harbor, out you know at the beach, certain beaches, certain bodies of water on the island where the scallops live. But you see people in these waders, right? And they have these long rakes and they've got these floating baskets and they're out there catching all these scallops. And I've always wanted to do it. So we finally did it this weekend. And of course, Saturday was the day we were doing it with some friends. And wouldn't you know it, low tide was like at 6.30 a.m. So we were up at 5. We were in the water at 6.30 before the sun came up. It was so gorgeous. We went to a place called Madiket Harbor, and it turned out to be like the hot spot for scallops that day. So early bird catches the worm. Let me tell you, we got a lot of scallops. And then after we all caught our scallops, we went over to a friend's house and we had a shucking party in their driveway. And I learned how to shuck these scallops. And and it was much easier than I thought. But I will tell you too, by the time I got to the shucking part of the day, I was so tired because when you're out there raking you essentially have these long rakes. You're raking for scallops. It is a ton of work. Who knew? So we did the scalloping. We did the shucking. And then we cooked a feast. And it was supposed to be a lunch, but I will tell you, we didn't finish till like 7.30 that night. But we made all sorts of great recipes. We made ceviche with scallops. And ceviche, you, you essentially, we took these little base scallops and we sliced them up. And then we just uh, marinated them in lime juice. And we also added some jalapeno, sliced jalapeno. And you pop that in the fridge and just give it a couple hours because it's essentially kind of cooking in that lime juice. And then before we served it, we added cilantro and we added some lime zest and orange zest. We started to play. We added some diced avocado, a little bit of salt, a little olive oil. It was so good. We made a scallop dip. We sauteed scallops with garlic and olive oil and butter. 
and added that to homemade pasta. My friend's son-in-law made the pasta. Very impressed. What a son-in-law, right? So it was a great, great day. And it was such a cool experience. So I posted it on my Instagram story, but because not everybody follows me on Instagram, please follow me at Liz Weiss. I'm going to put it in my regular Instagram feed because I think this experience needs to live on forever. So head on over to Instagram. And again, my handle is at Liz Weiss. And scallops, by the way, uh, dash diet friendly. You know, seafood is dash diet friendly. And I think I ate enough bay scallops to last a lifetime. Anyway, it was a great day, but enough about me. Who is ready to hear from Roseanne? I certainly am. Roseanne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited you're on the show, and we have so much to cover today. So thanks for for making the time for us. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. All right, so let's jump right in. I want you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you work, where you live, you know, what do you do? And and of course, we always like to talk about our kids. So give us the Roseanne story. All right. Well, at the moment, I am sitting in my home office in Meadville, Pennsylvania, which is the northwestern part of Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh side, not the Philly side. And... I am sort of in transition between this office and an office on the Gulf Coast of Florida. So I'm hoping in the this year will be the year I sort of do some of my winter over there because we have some pretty heavy winters here in northwest Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. It'll be nice. Nice to be in the sunshine. Oh, yes. Blue skies are good. But we've had a beautiful summer here. I'm married with three sons. So I know that you and I share the boy mom title. They are almost grown and flown. And in fact, I just dropped off our baby to college last weekend. So I'm in transition. How's the mental status after dropping him off? Well, pretty good. I luckily am very busy right now with a lot of projects and haven't really had time to get too uh, emotional, I guess. Hmm. Okay. It's, and it's he's... quiet. Yeah. Oh, I'll bet it's quiet. You definitely notice the the change in dynamic when that happens, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we go, we ebb and flow. You know, it's funny because when you have little kids, obviously, you're just, you can barely keep your head above water. And then when they leave, it is kind of weird, right? It's like, yes, very Yeah, quiet. that's a good way to describe it, ebb and flow. So, so far, I haven't had that moment, you know, where you go to their room and start sobbing or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens. Happens to the best of us. It it certainly does. So you've got this website, this blog called Chew the Facts, and I love your logo. I'm going to put your logo in the show notes because it's just so cute. But you are so into taking the science of nutrition and really the facts, the science, and and presenting it to people in a way that they can really understand. So tell us a little bit about your blog, because I want everybody to head on over and check it out, because it's just like every blog post you do, it's like, oh, now I understand. So tell everybody a little bit about your blog. Sure. I have always had sort of an investigative mind. That's just how I am by nature. You know, I'm kind of a journalist, maybe at heart. And once we, you know, became part of this World Wide Web, where we have information coming at us in all directions, 24-7, the misinformation in, in any field, really, is astounding. And I really, you know, paused when people like my friends would say, hey, you know, did you hear? And I heard that this causes this, or we should avoid this, or this is bad for you. I really realized that a lot of people are not sure what they should be eating, what the truth is. They're scared, they're worried, they're guilty about the food that they're choosing for themselves, for their family. So that's sort of where I thought, you know, I'm going to focus on that. And all any news story that comes out, I want to sort of calm people down and explain the facts about that food, that ingredient, nutrition in general. Uh, because sometimes this the headlines are a little scary. Mm-hmm. They certainly are, yeah. So you're like a private eye, Roseanne the private eye. I'm like a private eye. And my first <laughs> website, I actually did a photo shoot with a trench coat on and a hat. And my photographer put a little nutrition facts like thing in the hat, you know, like the old uh, you the, know, like the, the detective, yeah, the yeah, detective yeah. hat. Yeah, yeah. 
So somewhere in my archives, I have those photos. That is so funny because I will (laughs) tell you that many years ago, when I had the Meal Makeover Mom brand with Janice uh-huh. Bissix, we wrote a monthly column for Nick Jr. Family Magazine, and they put a graphic of the two of us on every column where my head was like on a saucepan and hers was on a soup pot or something. It was just horrible. <laughs> and you can't complain. Like, we got this gig writing for Nick Jr. Family Magazine. This was huge, right? It's a national magazine. You don't then go back to your editors and say, um, excuse me. That is like horrible. Please take it down. But no, you just smile. So yeah, what are you going right. to do? Yeah. I don't want to be cartoon kitchen equipment, please. Yeah. I have to dig that up. I want to dig that up because that was pretty darn funny. So why did you become a registered dietitian? What happened in your past that led you down that path? Oh, boy. These are always really interesting stories. I always enjoy listening to other dietitians, you know, talk about that. So, and there's always a story, right? I had a lot of food intolerances and some digestive issues during adolescence. So they began around age 12. And I was diagnosed with, at the time, quote, food allergies. And they identified that dairy, tomato, citrus, peanuts, and chocolate were off limits for me. So indeed, they weren't really allergies, but they were perhaps intolerances, you know, with a skin test. This was way back in the 70s. And I had, you know, belly aches and issues uh, all through adolescence. And my mom was really way ahead of her time. She, you know, modified recipes and, you know, figured out ways to to let me enjoy food because, you know, I'm going to middle school and you can't eat pizza at the sleepover party because no tomato, no cheese. And I was Italian, so, you know, there's tomato sauce everywhere. So it was a little rough, but I adjusted. When I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Interestingly, I did love, I began, my love of writing started early in high school. But that never occurred to me that I could have a career or, you know, what would I do with that? And I was kind of good in math, so I went to college pretty much clueless but thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll be a finance major or something, or an accountant, which is ridiculous. Exactly. Can you imagine me as an accountant? No. And then about, maybe it was Christmas break, sometime before my sophomore year, my sister-in-law suggested, because I had all of these food issues and GI issues, maybe you should be a nutritionist. And, you know, lo and behold, I was at a school that had an accredited program for clinical dietetics and nutrition. And I thought, hmm, maybe I'll do that. So there it was. Voila. Did you ever figure out the stomach, like the GI thing? What was it in the end? Yes. In my sophomore year of college, I was finally diagnosed with mild Crohn's colitis. So Crohn's disease is a gastrointestinal disease. And... You know, in the when I was in high school, no one knew what any of this was. Right, no one right. knew anything about food intolerances or allergies or celiac. You know, certainly, we didn't talk about that. Right, any of these GI disorders, and it became chronic by the time I was, you know, about halfway through school. And certainly, stress had a lot to do with it at that time. And then I finally, you know, was diagnosed by a gastroenterologist and you know was treated. And luckily, it's always been a mild case. So there it is. Wow. And it's a good thing you're a dietitian because you can really hone in and take care of that part of the business, right? Absolutely. And and as I said, my mother was really, you know, she was smart and she got it. Like she knew that diet modification was important. Mm -hmm. My father had heart disease and she listened to, to whatever advice the doctor gave about, you know, lower fat milk. I mean, she did. She did it. And slower sodium and... So I grew up seeing those modifications, too, and how they worked. Made sense that you got into that field. Yeah. And you are married to a doctor now, too. So you're like a uh, quite the duo. Yeah. Yeah. It comes in handy. We used to have our neighbors, Gary and Diane. She was a nurse. He was a doctor. They sold their house and moved away. But boy, when my kids were young, I loved having them as neighbors because in a pinch, it's always good to have a doctor. Yeah. And a nurse. Okay. And then right. when, when we were neighbors, they have four kids. I was recipe testing for my cookbooks and I was constantly bringing food over for them to taste test and try. So it was a good, it was a very good neighborhood relationship. Yeah. So. Good partnership. Questions answered. And I have to, fun fact, when I was dating my husband, he, 
you know, somehow saw my medication. So for the Crohn's, so he's like, why are you taking that? <laughs> and I, you know, early on, I had to disclose my medical history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's snooping around in the medicine cabinet. <laughs> That's a red flag, Roseanne. But hey, you and Dave are still together. <laughs> no, it wasn't the medicine. It wasn't a snoop. It was sort of, you know, it was out there. An observation. On a counter. It was an, an, an yes. Well, we'll cut, we'll take. cut him some slack. This girl taking. So you have written this book called The Dash Diet for Two, Dash Diet for Two, 125 Heart Healthy Recipes to Lower Your Blood Pressure Together. And I love this book. I've been going through it. I cooked out of it last night. I sort of teased the recipe in the intro to the show. But before we dig into this book, because I do adore this book so much, you know, I'm like a complete cookbook junkie, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about high blood pressure because, you know, a lot of people listening, if you have little kids, you might be thinking, you know, I don't have high blood pressure or my kids certainly don't have it. Maybe an elderly parent does, but high blood pressure is a lot more common than you think. So I want to talk about high blood pressure and then we'll get into the DASH diet because this is such a healthy diet that I think is great no matter what your you know situation is. But talk a little bit about high blood pressure, Roseanne, in this country and how common is it? Are there racial disparities? And then I want you to give us your personal story since we've been very personal. We started with your GI tract, so we're moving up. But talk about your personal story too with high blood pressure, but just give us kind of that, some perspective on high blood pressure. Right. It is really common. Nearly half of all U.S. adults have high blood pressure and one in three in the world's population that we know of anyway, because wow. a lot of times it's also not diagnosed. It's not noticed or not noticed early enough. So it really, you know, and ultimately contributes to millions of deaths from heart disease, stroke, kidney failure every year. That's huge. That's a big yes. number. Half. Half, half of U.S. Yeah. adults. And medication is certainly uh, effective and often required, but there's no question that diet therapy plays a role too. And if not prevention, definitely treatment. There's some aspect to almost every disease that there's a genetic component and hypertension or high blood pressure falls under that category too. But there are some things that we can't control like our diet and lifestyle. So a lot of people think of a low sodium diet for high blood pressure, which certainly can play a role. But just talk about, oh, actually, before we get into diet, I know you, you wanted to talk just about population in general. You know, you said up to half of all adults have high blood pressure, but do we see certain population groups being at even greater risk? We do. And in fact, African Americans are at higher risk. We're not real certain exactly why. There you know, are various theories and hypotheses. There is a perhaps a genetic component. You know, we are having a lot of conversations about the stress that African American, the African American community is subject to. So certainly that environment and that amount of stress may impact because often high blood pressure is diagnosed earlier in the African American population. So yes, some people are at higher risk. And then of course, again, that family and that genetic component component. If you know your parents or your grandparents suffered from high blood pressure, you know, even if you're out there as a 20 year old thinking that, you know, you're going to live forever, you want to be aware of that family history because that has an impact and making some changes early can help control the situation later. Hmm. And, and what about you, Roseanne? What's the story on your blood pressure? Yes. Well, you know, here we are as dietitians. We were trained in our 20s. And most of us try to implement some of this, this prevention that we talk about. And I certainly have done that. I've tried to eat well, and I've exercised regularly my whole life. But I have that strong family history. My parents were fortunate, fortunate enough to live to the ripe age of 90. But my dad had coronary artery disease. My mother had both hypertension, high blood pressure, and uh, high lipid levels, so hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, in the blood. So I had a strong family history and I knew it. So I, I did my best to try to prevent it. But lo and behold, once I went through menopause, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. And that was after I wrote my first book about it. So <laughs> luckily, I'm on a very low dose of medication. And then at that point, I really put the triple effort into maintaining the DASH diet for myself. 
Let's talk about this DASH diet, because like I said, people think, oh, it must be a low-sodium diet if it's hypertension. So what's the DASH diet? Because I know people hear it. It gets voted like best diet, you know, in U.S. news every year. It's always in the top two. What is it? Yeah, let's first look at that word diet, because when people hear diet, they think weight loss. If you're overweight, losing weight generally will help bring your blood pressure numbers down. But this really isn't, that's not the focus. This isn't a weight loss diet. The word DASH is an acronym that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So we're throwing that word hypertension out there. Hypertension is the medical term for high blood pressure. So the DASH diet, I'd like to think of more as a lifestyle. You know, it's not a restrictive weight loss diet. It's a lifestyle. And it is based on clinical research, trials that were done, that were controlled and randomized, that compared different dietary patterns. And the dietary patterns that lowered blood pressure the most were called DASH. You know, that's where the DASH diet name came from, from those clinical trials. So you want to talk a little bit about what those are, what that pattern is? Yes, you're reading my mind. Yeah, what is that pattern? So what do you what do you eat if you are on this DASH lifestyle or this DASH diet? Yes. So you mentioned the sodium and people do associate low salt, low sodium with blood pressure. So it is a low sodium diet, but I like to focus on all of the other important components of the diet. In a nutshell, it is increasing intake of fruits and vegetables. So a total of about eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And we can talk maybe a little bit about what a serving is defined as. And two to three servings of dairy products a day, preferably low fat dairy, but some high fat dairy can be okay too. And then apart from that, it also is low in saturated fat. It is providing a good dose of fiber through those fruits and vegetables, but also some whole grains. And it is fairly low in sugar. So it's an all around healthy dietary pattern. And then that lifestyle component involves staying active, stress management, and you know, weight management, trying to maintain a reasonable weight. People can lose just 10% of their body weight if they're overweight, and that can make a huge difference in their blood pressure. Hmm. So it sounds like this diet, it always comes back to fruits and veggies, right? But it sounds like you're going to get calcium, you're going to get potassium, you're going to get magnesium. So vitamin K, like all these nutrients that play some sort of role in blood pressure control. Like I'm thinking that's probably how it's working, how it's doing its magic. Right. The potassium, also vitamin D, the calcium, important nutrients. So it's adding those nutrients. And then as we mention all of the time, food first, you know, not just not just supplementing, you can't just supplement because we're getting so much more besides potassium and antioxidants when we eat fruits and vegetables. We're getting a lot of other important nutrients that help keep us healthy and help with our heart health. I think I eat a DASH diet. I, I, I actually I think s- you do. Somebody asked me today what kind of diet I consume. And I said, well, I guess I would say I eat a Mediterranean diet. I probably eat the mind diet. I've done a show on that, which is a diet for brain health, but it's a Mediterranean dash diet, essentially. And I think probably a lot of my listeners, I would assume, are eating a dash style diet. It just feels to me like it's good for so many aspects of health, you know, not just high blood pressure, right? Because it's, it's all the fruits and veggies are in there. Right. And truly, Liz, I pretty much eat a Mediterranean style dash diet too, because that's the sort of food that I was brought up eating and I enjoy. So there's a lot of overlap between, you know, a flexitarian diet, you might hear that term sometime, and a Mediterranean diet. And you're absolutely right. The mind diet is a combination of Mediterranean and dash. The thing that stands out with dash and mind is they are based on clinical trials. So the the diet's name or acronym came from the clinical trial. The MIND trials were about brain health and cognitive health and what you're eating. It's always good. It's good to have studies, right, to back it up. We're not just making this up, people, right? We got the studies to prove it. Exactly, exactly. And we've talked, you know, you and I have talked over the past few months about the dietary guidelines. Those are essentially based on all of the research 
And that research would include the DASH clinical trials as well. So let's go inside your cookbook because it is a fantastic cookbook. And in the show notes, I'll put a post of the cover image and I'll link people over to Amazon. They can check it out. But take us inside the DASH diet for two book. You obviously go through the DASH diet. You talk about what sorts of cooking equipment, how to stock a pantry, but what else is in the book? Give us like what what sorts of chapters, what kinds of recipes? And then I think we'll get kind of, we'll dig into a few because I actually made one of them last night and I think the recipes look fantastic. So tell us a little bit about what's inside the book. Absolutely. Yes. There is sort of a primer, right? In the first few pages that give you gives you the lowdown on you know what a serving is and what kinds of foods you should be eating a little bit about blood cholesterol and diabetes and then as i said what those guidelines for the dash diet is and then this book is called dash diet for two so it focuses on cooking and eating for two and i love that because i'm a new empty nester myself I mentioned those young people who may have a family history of high blood pressure, and they may be cooking in a household for two also, you know, maybe just a roommate or a partner. So I give some advice on how to stock your pantry, how to stock even some cookware, because when you switch from, you know, the giant casserole dish for your family of four or six or whatever, to just cooking for two people, you know, you need to look into some smaller dishes that you can bake with or, or cook with. And we talk about a little bit about food labels and a little bit about how to sort of stock all of the other things in your pantry too. What I, I have a list of must haves and then, you know, oh, well, these are nice to have because if you have a well-stocked kitchen, it makes it easier to cook. It sure does. It sure does. Especially when you walk in the door and you have no idea what you're making for dinner. What about chapters then? I know you have breakfast. Yes, we have. We have breakfast. We have soups and salads. I have a chapter on snacks because, you know, snacks are important too. And when you're trying to follow a dietary plan to lower blood pressure, you want all of your food to to matter to help you lower blood pressure. So we've got snacks in there and we've got desserts and sweets, chapter two. But I have meatless mains and then a fish and seafood chapter, poultry, pork and beef, and then side dishes. I love it. I love it. And you you have, you know, as I was going through the book, what is it, like 150 recipes, I think? 125. That's a lot. That's a lot of recipes. So I was on page 41, and I saw that you had a recipe for a Dash-style Cobb salad. So when I think of a Cobb salad, I think there is going to be bacon. There's going to be like a mound of cheese. The dressing is going to be over-the-top creamy. And I know you said dairy was okay, but what makes that a Dash style Cobb salad? Like, what did you do to it to make it Dash friendly? Yes. And I did this with a lot of recipes in the book. My goal with the recipes was really to try to, I was, I'm speaking to people who don't want to get super fancy in the kitchen, may not have a ton of cooking skill and want to enjoy some traditional recipes. So this is one of them. What you just described is the typical Cobb salad. So I just tweaked it a little. Okay, the bacon, I I personally don't love bacon, but I do love flavoring with it sometimes. And sometimes I eat bacon, but it's loaded with sodium and it's loaded with saturated fat. So it's not a, a daily or weekly treat for people with high blood pressure. So I skipped it completely on this in this recipe. But instead, I used some roasted sunflower seeds, because seeds have healthy fat, and they'll give the salad a little bit of crunch, a little bit of a texture, a texture to it. And I also simply cut down on the blue cheese crumbles, because to me, the blue cheese is absolutely important for the whole flavor profile of the salad. So I kept it but not as much. And I talk to people a lot about that. It's not always that well, you can never have that. It's how much because any item, let's look at blue cheese. If you have half the amount, you're also getting half the sodium and half the saturated fat. So that's a win. And then most of the recipes in the book, including this Cobb salad, then I just amp up the vegetables, you know, more sliced tomato, a little more avocado since we took away the bacon and some of that blue cheese. And then I did a lighter dressing that uses healthy fats. Sounds good to me. 
<laughs> There's, you know, I saw a recipe, I think it was on Amy Gorin's website. I want to say she made like salmon bacon or something. Have you seen this? I did see that yesterday, but I didn't get to follow through to the whole recipe. Interesting. I need to check that out. We need to get on that. I wonder if it was smoked salmon. You are the detective in the group. You need to get on that. And because salmon would be a great, is a great dash food. And that would be a lovely addition to this cob salad, wouldn't it? Now, Roseanne and I, and I shared this in the intro to the show, we do this weekly nutrition in an Insta on Instagram. That's like an Instagram live. And maybe Roseanne, we need to do a whole episode on bacon and play around with some alternatives. That could be really fun. That could be fun. We're on it. We're on it. All right. But I got to keep going through your recipes because there's another recipe. And I saw you had actually posted this to Instagram and I am desperate to make it for grilled shrimp stuffed poppers. Now in my fridge right now, I have these mini sweet bell peppers. And in this recipe, you just cut them in half and you seed them. And then you stuff them with low fat cream cheese or goat cheese that you've softened. Within you mix into the the cream cheese, you mix in some cooked shrimp that you've diced up. You add paprika and some chili sauce and some honey. And you stuff these peppers and then you bake them. I am mm-hmm. dying over this recipe. It just, <laughs> I am not really good at appetizers, I have to admit. And a friend of mine was having some, a neighbor, she was having some friends over the other night and she said, I need a good appetizer. And I told her about this. It just looks so easy and it sounds so yummy. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a crowd pleaser. And I'm always looking for an appetizer. I mean, you probably can relate to this. When you're getting invited to the party as a dietitian, we often think, well, I've got to bring the healthy thing. And I really, generally, I want to, because sometimes, depending on the party, there may not be many dash-friendly foods there. So this is really a, a crowd pleaser, and I've made it for my family, because my husband and I, when we were young, you know, we'd love to go out for a beer, and he loved cream cheese pepper poppers, like from a pub that are the jalapenos stuffed with cream cheese, breaded, and then, of course, put into a deep fryer. So I wanted to kind of create something that was similar to that without the deep frying. And you could use jalapeno if you want, you know, if you want that hot. But yeah, I love these. Mm, And they're so pretty too. That's the other thing. I'm even thinking for kids, this would be really fun because the peppers are orange, some are red, some are yellow. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can make it ahead before you roast it or grill it. And the shrimp, you know, we talked about eggs in one of our Nutrition in an Insta episode and cholesterol. Back in the day, shrimp got a bad reputation about because it's high in cholesterol, but it's super, super low in saturated fat. So you can eat shrimp. Shrimp is good. And it makes a great addition to that stuffed pepper. Hey, how do eggs fit into the DASH diet? Eggs are allowed in the DASH diet. I have several egg recipes in the book. You know, they're a good source of protein and in moderation, eggs are absolutely fine. And you also have meat. There's red meat in the book. So, you know, people, I think, always feel like these diets are restrictive. I mean, if you hear about a low sodium diet, yeah, that sounds restrictive. To me, the DASH diet, the DASH lifestyle seems very inclusive, like there's so much to choose from. Absolutely. And that is, you know, sort of my my carrot for people. I want to pull you in to help you understand that you can still enjoy what you eat and you can still enjoy some of those old favorites or traditional foods that maybe you somehow got the idea that they're off limits and some of them might have been, but you know, you can modify them so that you can include them. I have a whole chapter on pork and beef with recipes to include with meats. Again, it's the portion size. You can enjoy a great steak. But we're talking, you know, a three to five ounce piece, not a eight to 12 ounce piece. And then it's what else are you balancing your plate with in addition to that steak? Right. So, right. yeah, I, I made it. the enchiladas last night, the beef, uh, the vegged up beef enchiladas. So I used lean ground beef in that recipe, but then I added beans and I added the secret ingredient for the sauce, which is canned pumpkin. Mm-hmm. I have a recipe similar to that where I make, I mix enchilada sauce with some canned pumpkin and you would never know it was in there because it's just maybe a half a cup, 
but you get the fiber and you get all those good nutrients. And of course, you know, like pumpkin is packed with great nutrition. And what you don't use, you can freeze in Ziplocs and then just thaw and use in pancakes or whatever you want to use them in down the road. So you, so nothing goes to waste, right? Right, right. So if you, you know, make a pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving, you've got a half a can left, you can make enchiladas that week. I love it. You have leftover turkey, make turkey enchiladas. Absolutely. Give us a few tips, Roseanne, on cutting sodium, reducing sodium in the diet without sacrificing flavor. Because, you know, back in the day, I can remember people making a green salad and just squeezing lemon juice on top. And that was kind of it. It sounded dreadful. But I know lemon is a great tool for cutting sodium, but give us a few ideas. Yes. And and lemon, we'll start with the lemon and the citrus. It is a great tool, but we want you to include that healthy fat with that with that lemon juice, some olive oil or a little avocado oil. How can you reduce the salt and the sodium in recipes? Well, start with the most obvious, re- literally reducing the amount of salt. So if a, even another recipe from another cookbook that you use has a teaspoon of salt in it, cut it down to a half a teaspoon of salt, and that'll reduce the sodium in every serving. I encourage people to stock up on some salt-free seasonings and spices And just straightforward spices, things like chili powder, paprika, cumin, even things like cinnamon, nutmeg, those are all naturally salt-free, and they add a great boost of flavor. We talked about this enchilada recipe, and you mentioned using that pumpkin and no one knew it was there. It's really not, you know, we, we think of pumpkin, it's really about the cinnamon in the nutmeg that we're tasting. The pumpkin itself doesn't really have a really strong flavor. So when you add a different spice like chili powder or cumin, it changes that flavor profile. You also can use things like sun-dried tomatoes or tomato paste. I like to buy the tubes of tomato mm-hmm. paste. Mm-hmm. Do you use those? Oh, I do. Of course. Yes, yes, ma'am. Because, you know, you can buy canned tomato paste, but you may not need a whole can. You might just need a teaspoon or a tablespoon of that rich concentrated tomato flavor And it's just tomatoes. It's just pureed, concentrated tomatoes, nothing added. And that can really add a layer of flavor to a dish. And then packaged foods. Most packaged foods are going to have variable amounts of sodium in them. One fun fact that people are not always aware of is bread is fairly high in sodium. So you want to compare brands. You want to read the nutrition facts panel on packages and check out that sodium line and compare from one to the other and choose the lower sodium. And again, you know, two slices of bread is going to have less sodium than four slices of bread. (laughs) So you want to modify your intake all day. I think people are so surprised. I think I've always heard that the number one source of sodium in the American diet is bread. Huge surprise for people, the bread group. It's not about the carbs. We don't mind the carbs. But when you need to reduce your sodium intake, you want to look at your total bread intake. Right, right. So bread leads me to pasta. And you have a recipe in the book, page 87, for noodles with mushrooms and cabbage. Now, back in January, just so everyone knows, I was in Budapest at a nutrition conference uh, called Food Fluence, and Roseanne was there. And that's really how Roseanne and I have become friends because we're at this conference every year. This year, it happened to be in Budapest. And this was pre-COVID, kind of our the last big trip many of us took before things went awry. But we ate a lot of cabbage when we were in Hungary, in Budapest. And lo and behold, I'm going through your book and I see this recipe for noodles with mushrooms and cabbage. And I'm going to blog this recipe, if it's okay with you, Roseanne, and and we'll have a whole separate blog post on it because I love it. And I feel like you could do a lot with it. You could play with it. You could change it up if you wanted to. But in and of itself... I really think it's a great recipe. We, I made it with gluten-free pasta because Simon's gluten-free, but, and I did not use egg noodles. I used penne. So I apologize for that, (laughs) but I've already, I'm, I'm a meddler. I change things up. That's what I do. But can you talk everybody through this recipe? And you, I've noticed you like to use cayenne pepper in your recipes. And I really loved the cayenne in this, but talk us through, tell us what we need for this recipe. What's in it? How do you make it? Yes. Well, First of all, I came up with this recipe for the book after our trip to Budapest, and I was absolutely inspired by that trip to include some noodles and cabbage in this book. On top of that, I grew up in Pittsburgh, so a little backstory on noodles and cabbage for me. And I had a job at one point where I worked 
on Fridays in a area that had a Polish neighborhood. So during Lent, as a Catholic, we avoid meat during Lent, and one of the churches would have food available on Fridays. So we would always order from this church for lunch, takeout, and I always got their noodles and cabbage because, you know, it was like the Polish grandmas were making pierogies and noodles and cabbage, and it was amazing. So I love noodles and cabbage from way back. That's called holushki, if anyone cares. But Oh, they care. They care. <laughs> <laughs> and I do prefer, I will always make it personally for the, with the egg, noodle, egg noodles because I don't have a gluten issue in this household. So I like using the egg noodles and a little bit of onions and, of course, some butter. I reduce the butter in this recipe, and you'll see that I use unsalted butter to manage the overall sodium. And I do like a little kick of pepper, not a lot, not so that you're, you know, have to drink a glass of water, just a little bit of a bite in the background to sort of elevate the whole experience. Mm. And a typical, you know, a typical dish is bathed in butter. So this is modified a little. Yeah, it is very buttery, a typical dish. And you use about three cups of cabbage, sliced cabbage. I think I might've added a little bit more, but what I liked when, when I was making this is I sauteed the onion and the mushrooms. I started by sauteing that in olive oil and then I added the cabbage. I stirred it in and then I covered the, the saucepan. And by covering it, it sauteed and it also kind of steamed because cabbage takes a while to cook. And it really just took 10, 15 minutes, as you say in the recipe, to cook till it got tender. Right, tenza, as we say. And because I grew up in New York and I can say tenza. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was delicious. I used the red cabbage. That's what I had in my fridge. And like I said, I used the penne, but I wish I had egg noodles. I didn't have them. And it was sort of on a whim last night. It's like, okay, I've got to make something from this book because I had like all these recipes I wanted to try. And the poppers, I, well, I don't think I had everything I needed for those. But this recipe is just a good, great weeknight recipe. And you could turn this easily into a heartier meal by adding some chicken or some leftover salmon or really anything I think would go with this recipe. Absolutely. Yeah. It could be a main dish. It could be a side dish. And, the, you know, those buttery noodles, the egg noodles just sort of taste buttery on their own. So yeah, they work. And then of course we added extra veggies with the mushrooms and the cabbage. Got to add your veggies. And definitely red or, or green, either can work. Yeah. Yeah. I think cabbage is underrated. You know, it's an inexpensive vegetable. It lasts forever in the fridge. It's so packed with fiber and good nutrition. People need to eat it more. We, we will do a cabbage show as well. We'll do a nutrition in an instant just on cabbage. I think we need to do this. It's good, a good one to do in the winter. Cruciferous. It's one of my favorite words. I like to throw that around at my kids. You need your cruciferous vegetables. You're a show off. Good for your gut. You ever show off? Yeah, it does. It is good for the gut. It's a prebiotic. It all that gut bacteria loves to eat cabbage. Oh, we will do a nutrition in an insta on that topic. I love it. The recipe I was going to make, and I actually did send my husband to the store, and then I got sidetracked and made this cabbage dish. I was going to make your baked apple recipe on page one seventy eight of the book because you know desserts are not off limits in the book. And then baked apples to me, it's just such a good memory food because I grew up eating those. And I think everybody should try baked apples if they haven't already. And that recipe looks really good. Yes. And I sort of associate those with fall because there's a lot of apple picking that goes on in this part of the country in the Northeast. So they're just a nice, cozy fall dish. Could be a nice after school snack. You could top it with a little bit of yogurt, you know, a little Greek yogurt. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, we would, I believe, pour heavy cream on top is what my mother would do. So maybe not for this recipe, but that's what we would do. And of course, you know, I reduced the sugar. So you're not loading it up with sugar and you're adding a few heart healthy nuts and yeah, yummy. It's all good. It's all good. It's a great book. And I think you've done a great job demystifying the DASH diet, the DASH lifestyle, and just making it so user friendly for anybody and everybody. And if anyone's listening who's an empty nester, or maybe you've got kids at home, all you have to do is double the recipe. I mean, this cabbage recipe serve four easily, but so some of your recipes serve two, some serve four. So you have leftovers and, you know, you can do the math. This is easy math. We can, we can double this. We can double a recipe here and there, right? Yes, absolutely. Most of the recipes are for two. Some are for two to three. So you have maybe a leftover you can eat for lunch. And there are a few that are for four servings, but absolutely. 
And I have to say, I was really excited when they sent me the cover. You know, when you write a book, you're writing it. And the last thing to do is the cover people come and send you proofs. And they chose the 50-50 burger to put on the cover. And I loved it because I love a good burger. And a lot of people like a good burger. And you wouldn't think that I, you know, that we'd be recommending burgers when you have high blood pressure or heart disease. But this is a good burger to make. Is it 50-50 because you add chopped mushrooms? Yes, chopped mushrooms. So it's half the beef and then half mushrooms. And that you end up with using less beef, lowering the saturated fat, but still getting the nutrition from beef, and then adding the nutrients from the mushrooms. And the mushrooms help make it really moist, and it's delicious. Do you saute the mushrooms first or just add them as I is? do. Yes. And I recommend it in uh, my recipe. And I like to use portobello and I do like to saute them. Mm. That way they, you know, they just make it moister and it's easier to make sure you have a consistent product when you grill the burger. Kind of meaty. I love it. I love it. Well, Roseanne, so many great recipes in the book. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. I don't know if you have any final parting thoughts for us on on the DASH diet or anything else that you think we haven't shared that we need to cover before I, uh, before we sign up for the day here? Well, I don't think so. I just want people to know that it's, they don't have to be intimidated about, you know, eating well or eating a therapeutic diet. It's, it can be fun and enjoyable and tasty. Good stuff. Good stuff. It's a winner. It wins best diet every year or, or, or runner up. And I can see why based on the delicious recipes you have in the book. So, Thank you so much for hopping on the call today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Can I add one more thing? Of course, you can add 10 more things. Go for it. Because what I'm I'm continuing to work on my next book. Yes, and I know I was going to ask you that. So go for it. Tell us about it. So I I, will mention it because that's what I'm going to do when we're done (laughs) with, with this show. Continue editing chapters. Dash Diet for Dummies is another Dash book in in the Four Dummies series. And we are working on the second edition. So very excited about that. I co-authored that one with Cindy Kleckner, who's a culinary dietitian, and Dr. Sarah Saman, who's a cardiologist. So it's almost like a reference book. We do include 45 recipes, but it's a great nutrition primer for not just consumers, but dietitians too, who might be working with patients with heart disease. Dr. Saman does a great job telling you everything you want to know about how the heart works and what blood pressure is all about. So that's coming out in November 2020. Oh my gosh, you're just going to barely be done promoting this book and then you have another book. Yeah. You're busy. You're a busy lady. I might be back, Liz. You might be back. And I'm going to stop complaining about how busy I am because I'm like, what am I doing? It's, <laughs> it's like a you're, good year to be busy. I have not cranked out two new books, you know, in six weeks. Like, I mean, you're just like a book machine. So congratulations on the new book. And thanks again for coming on to the podcast. Thanks so much, Liz. All right. Well, thank you. And Rosanna and I, of course, will see each other every Wednesday on Nutrition in an Insta on Instagram. So be sure to follow Roseanne on at Chew the Facts and follow me at at Liz Weiss on Instagram. But you know, in the show notes, you're going to get links to Roseanne's website and the book and we'll be sharing a lot of recipes. So be sure to head on over and check out the show notes. And of course, as always, if you love today's show, tell a friend about it. Hey, tell half of the US population about it since you know, we've got a lot of people dealing with the, with hypertension out there. And you know, you can always post a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table. <laughs>